All right, slightly different from my normal thing, because normally I don't do spoiler reviews. I find there's just too much to talk about, and I either talk about the same thing way too much or just get lost. But um, I want to talk about why... I'm doing this like, you know, like I'm not doing uh, a review of a season, the equivalent of like, you know, people who do videos about a specific episode of a TV show. Uh, and it's for a chapter, because I just read, read... I was rereading Sailing to Sorrentium by Guy Gavril K, largely because there's a mini read-along going on, on on Mike's channel. And I, I wanted to reread the Sarantine Mosaic. And I read chapter three of Sailing to Sarantium, and I just wanted to talk about why it's why it's really, really, really good. So spoilers for chapter three of Sailing to Sarantium. This this video is for my guy Gavril K fans. Uh, I'm not gonna like spoil the rest of the book, but still go read Sailing to Sarantium. Anyway, um so Sailing to Sarantium, because I know normal people aren't like, ah oh, yes, chapter three of Sailing to Sarantium. I of course know exactly what happened. Um that that is the chapter. It starts with with Kaiza. Um, who, for those who don't remember names, is kind of the person who starts off, who's, who's the prostitute character at the, the inn, like the official inn where, like, couriers can stay at. Um, and we've just learned in the chapter before that uh, in two days is the Day of the Dead. And we don't know what the Day of the Dead is, but uh, Crispin has been told, do not go outside on the Day of the Dead, just to stay inside. And we also know that some supernatural things can be going on because he has a bird that can talk to him in his brain. Um, and the person who made that bird is the person saying, don't go outside in Day of the Dead. And Kaiza it works at this inn and is one of the prostitutes and is kind of like, who's a slave um, who, who got sold, who's who been sold into slavery somewhat recently and is kind of like last on the pecking order, like gets all the crap jobs, um, which is as terrible as it sounds. Um, and... Everyone is being, like, really nice to her, and she, kind of, and she, like, you know, isn't getting the really bad jobs, and, like, they're making sure she doesn't get hurt, and she realizes they are going to sacrifice her for the Day of the Dead, and she's going to die in two days, and, um, if she runs, she'll be outside on the Day of the Dead, and also she's, like, a slave girl in the middle of the Serentine Empire, so running, she'll just get executed, um, so she is, uh, you know, as one would, panicking, and I just want to mention as a minor thing that... I love about this chapter, like a minor bit of detail, is that once she realizes that they can't hurt her because they have to preserve her to then sacrifice her in two days, um, she starts just like casually insulting her co-workers who are treating her horribly. And, and it's just hilarious. Like one of the people who I guess is like her owner um, tells her to like do something and she just casually goes like, fuck yourself <laughs> and keeps walking. And I like, girl, I know you're dying in two days probably, but that had to be satisfying to just be able to tell your like horrible boss owner person who, um, uh, you, yeah, to just like be able to tell him to fuck himself. Anyway, um, then we cut to Crispin who's walking through the woods and there's, there's a, there's a thing about like a, a reoccurring kind of theme of this novel. And one reason why it's split into Sailing to Sorrentium, the main premise is we're going from one walled city to another walled city and having to go through the wilderness in between. And Crispin is like a, a city person. He's not comfortable outside. And there's, there's imagery of like how unknown the forests in the dark is because he's, he's walking outside, you know, near nighttime and there's like forests surrounding him. And it's just like, there's a wall there and whatever behind that is completely unknown. Whether it is supernatural, natural, it, it is completely unknown to him. It is another world. Um, and he shows up at this inn and uh, and and the person who's like at the door when he gets here, because he, he has a thing to stay at the courier inn, is, is Kaiza. And Kaiza, seeing this new person, is like... Um, Crispin starts, like, requesting, like, yeah, yeah, I want to get, like, a bath and all of this, and he's like, crap, like, did she not understand, um, Rodian? I'll, I'll switch languages, and then as he's about to switch languages, Kaiser is just like, they're going to kill you tomorrow, can you take me away? Um, and, and there's a line here that normally I would, actually, normally I'd be like, I don't know how I feel about this, because there's a metaphor, and it's like, her eyes were enormous, deep as a forest, deep as like the forest or something, which normally I'd be like deep as the forest, but there was just a bunch of imagery about like how alien and otherworldly and mysterious the forests are to Crispin. So it works so well. Um, and, and then there's, there's actually, there's more good stuff. Like even for a chapter, I feel like I can't cover all the reasons that makes it good. Although it's a particularly good chapter. Um, saying that it's probably like the 25th best chapter in the Serentine Mosaic. So man was on something when he wrote this. I don't know what's going on. Um, but then also, like, the entire sequence of, of Crispin then deciding to uh, be like, okay, yes, this is a thing, agreeing to try and save Kaiza, 
and how he goes about it. It's just brilliant. Like, it's so well-paced. It POV hops between three different point of views, Kaiser and Crispin being two, um, and then, um, like, a, a merchant's nephew who's got, like, a gambling debt and is worried that, like, when he gets home, people are going to break his legs um, it is another. And just the way he POV hops is so seamless, and the pacing of it is so good. Uh, and also, just, uh, I love that it actually is, when you think about it, m explored how morally ambiguous this is. Because it, it seems straightforwardly good. Like, you're saving someone from being sacrificed. Like, that seems good. You're saving this slave's life and, and uh, saving them from being a slave. But also, he fully realizes that, like, if he saves Kaiser's life, they're probably just going to sacrifice another person. Um, and he's kind of like, he's aware of that while putting it to the back of his head. Um, and also there's this merchant's nephew who he kind of like has to, and has to like frame for stealing his purse to be able to, as, as a part of the plan, which the plan is brilliantly done, by the way, it's a great example of characters actually doing smart things instead of just being told they're smart, where it's actually, I mean, you are told Crispin is smart, but then you see the plan and you're like, Hey, that's a really good plan. And also the dialogue of like how fake drunk Crispin's dialogue is written. And I forgot to mention the best scene in like this entire section somehow is when Kaiser now realizes Crispin is going to help her. Um, Crispin is so aware of like just her desire to be alive. It's like, because uh, it, he's lost, he kind of doesn't really have that anymore. Like his premise, like his character, he, he lost his family, like his wife and kids in a plague. And he's kind of going to Sarantium like he cares about making art, but, like, one of the reasons he's doing this is he doesn't actually care that much about his life. Um, and I, I think just seeing the contrast to that with Kaizo was just such a vivid scene. And, like, all these characters are one-offs. Like, you're never going to meet most of these characters again. Although, when you get a new POV in a Guy Gavro K book, you never know. Is this a one-off that we're never going to meet again, or is this the new main character? Uh, but most of them are one-offs. Um, and you get such a good idea of what's going on with them so well. Um, and, and, and it's just, ah, it's, it's absurd. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I got. I, um, and yeah, the plan works. He hits the guy in the head and then it ends with, um, he, he basically, he like, as someone who wasn't supposed to be staying here, stole, uh, tried to steal my person permit. So I think all this, this slave girl she, she's the only reason it didn't get stolen. I think I'll buy her from you. Uh, I think I'll have her, like, as repayment. I won't tell the Chancellor that you're, like, cheating the system, um, which was part of the plan. And then, at the end of it, the realization that, one, not only he might not have actually succeeded something, and there's a brilliant line in there as he's, like, hitting the guys in the head who he's framing, who, like, yeah, went to steal his stuff, but also he completely entrapped into stealing his stuff. Um... He thinks to himself, there's like a random line of, he wondered if uh, a mother out there somewhere loved this boy. Um, anyway, I, I just love that it considers both who it's helping, but also like Crispin is conflicted about this. And it's not clear to him that he's doing the right thing, but he also doesn't have time to think about it. And not making a decision is a decision. Uh, and anyway, the conclusion of it all is they realize that they're not going to be able to stay here for another day. So they are going to be going outside on the Day of the Dead, and oh, I love this chapter, and it's like the 25th best chapter in this series. Ah, oh, so good. Anyway, that's my, I guess, vlog? Is this a reading vlog? I don't know. This is my spoiler review of a chapter. This is a thing now. Uh, Serentine fans, hope you enjoyed it.